Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Bible study, working our way through uh, John's Gospel, uh, Abiding Savior, Lutheran Church. Uh, we're in chapter 11, where Jesus raises Lazarus. Um, and before we get into that study, we will uh, have our psalm of the day to have our opening prayer. That's Psalm 24, uh, page 111. Uh, since today is Palm Sunday, uh, our Bible study uh, is obviously before Palm Sunday because Jesus is raising Lazarus, but our psalm will be the Palm Sunday psalm we'll use in worship. So make sure you have the gray, not the blue book. Um, that will be very confusing to you the, the, because uh, the, while the psalm is in there in the blue book, it's not the entire psalm. So page 111 in the Psalter gray book, and let me read the introduction at the bottom of the page in italics. It says, the church sings Psalm 24 in services on the first Sunday in Advent and Palm Sunday, both anticipating the arrival of Christ the Lord. The psalm is a processional liturgy for the entrance of the King of Glory into Zion. Martin Luther said, Psalm 24 is a prophecy of the kingdom of Christ in all the world. It calls on the doors of the world that is, kings and princes, to make room for the kingdom of Christ, for they are the usual ones who rage against him, Psalms 1 and 2, and say, who is the king of glory? So we'll read the Psalm of David. Um, I'll read the, the first line, and y'all can respond with the uh, one or two lines that are indented. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas, and established it on the waters. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false God. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him. Who sees your face, God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory. Let's pray. Lord God, though heaven and earth are yours, the human heart has no room for you. Open wide the gates of our hearts, that your Son may enter and rule there as King. Let his life of clean hands and a pure heart rest on us, that we may always live with you, through Christ our Lord. Amen. So getting back to uh, Jesus uh, at uh, Bethany with Lazarus, uh, from last week's study we left off, uh, Jesus had already delayed in going to Bethany uh, where his friend Lazarus was sick. He waited until uh, Lazarus had died and we had at the very bottom of that page of verse uh, 16, Thomas's, well, comment filled with pessimism and yet devotion. Uh, there was a mixture of doubt about the future, but then also courage to go with Jesus, right? Let's go too, so that we may die with him. He knew the opposition that was there with Jesus, but he was uh, intent at this moment on, on following him. Um, the conversation we did cover last week at John 11 verses 17 through, through 24 between Jesus uh, and Martha, as Martha met him on the road, and that, that comment that I think always tugs on my heartstrings when I read it, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Right? If only you had done more, right? But, uh, and yet a uh, comment that was full of faith as well. Not really accusatory, wasn't really that. She was, she, because especially with that follow-up statement, but even now I know that whatever you ask from God, he will give you. So that, that, uh, that word that could have been accusatory really was just a statement of fact and just 
saying, I know that that would have happened if you had been here, but now I'm just going to go forward in your hands and, and trust. We didn't really co comment on that or, or discuss that in, in much detail last week. Does anybody have any comments or, or thoughts uh, to, to bring forward um, about, about that response of, of Martha here in verse 21? So she must have been in the kitchen listening a little bit at least, right? Maybe like the, the ladies who on occasion have the Lenten service and now that we got the microphone working in here that they can actually hear a little bit of the sermon like through the loudspeakers, right? So, so Martha has some very good words of faith. Um, so we don't, we don't need to beat, up, beat her up too much um, when Jesus uh, was at the home, right? Um, we can say that she was listening as well. Right. Um, and that conversation leads to verse 25. And I'm going to just have all of us read it together. Uh, there's a verse in John to memorize. This would, if there are 20 verses in John to memorize, this would be one of them. Right? Uh, let's say it together here in verse 25 and 26. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even if he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never perish. Do you believe this? Thoughts, comments on resurrection, life. One of Jesus' I am statements, right? And as you have that uh, Jesus in effect saying, saying the name of the Lord, I am, and as he says that, uh, he follows up with uh, the resurrection coming back to life, right? Um, and how does that resurrection, how does that life happen? Well, that first statement, whoever believes in me, me will live even if he dies. Um, that faith is what we have that, that, that defeats death, that, that life continues even in that face of death. And living and believing in me will never perish. And, and it almost sounds like, if you read it, uh, a contrast, right? If he dies, but then he'll never perish. But you have a little bit, you, you have a, a little bit of a distinction there. Actually, it's a big distinction. The death of the body, the heart stopping, right? That, he says, even if that happens, and you can almost take out the if, right? You can say, even when, he dies, he will live, but never perish, that uh, will never be, uh, uh, never uh, be eternal death, never be the, the perishing of eternally separated from God. The questions or comments uh, uh, there in verse 25, we discussed it a little bit last week, but didn't have a whole lot of time to dig into it. But maybe it's just one of those that you just say, ah, let me just meditate on this, but Chris, please. Uh, my study Bible mentions that this step also is a reminder that death is impossible for Jesus through, through death. Okay, so death is impossible for Jesus, is that what you said? Yes. That's so, yeah, yeah Jesus, um, you, would you read that quote from there? Kind of, if you if people my interest there, I haven't heard you quite say it that way. Jesus was saying more than, uh, than that he gives resurrection and life. In the same way, these are identified him with, uh, identified with him, and his nature is such that final death is impossible for him. He is life. Okay. He is life. What life was from him, he is life. Um, and yeah, I, I like the, that, that commentary. Um, your first statement, uh, if you take out that word final, we, ha we have an issue with it, right? right? Because death is possible for him. Surprisingly, for God, death was possible, yes, because he is the God-man. That we can literally say God died. That was possible, we'll see that with Jesus. But final death or eternal death, Death without the death without life, the, the resurrection life that Jesus had and com coming back to life, and then also that he gives that right with God, that was not going to be possible for him. Uh, it is not possible for him. 
So thank you for re reading that. Uh, and then that's a very important word that their uh, the final death is, is impossible. Anybody else, any comments on there? Would it be the, the son part of God died, but not God? The father. Yeah, the we want, our, our minds want to understand the parts of the Trinity, but we can't separate the parts of the Trinity. All right? So, so once you take, say, father died, so, so, yeah, the son died, but God died. Even though God the Father did not die, God died. So if God died, how could anything continue? Yeah, God, the, and, and think of, thing, yeah, right, exactly. How could things continue? What happened with the, the sun being covered over, right? And, and the earthquake and, and those different things. Um, so there's, there's a lot of things that we just say, wow, that's unfathomable. I don't understand, but we recognize that God did die at the crucifixion, and that was necessary because if it was just a man who died, would our sins have been paid for? No, he would have paid for his own sins or the sins of one person, but to pay for the sins of the whole world, it had to be God. So that, that's the, uh, you know, the, the thing of Christology or the person of Christ that we recognize when he say Jesus is true God and true man, there's a lot of meat and depth behind that and importance as well. So that help uh, if please see There's still three separate persons in yeah. one God. Three persons in one God. And we we can distinguish the persons without dividing the God. <clears throat> That we just did, right? And then the, the Trinity. And, and if you understand it, let me know. <laughs> uh, Dave? Well, that's what I was just going to mention. The Trinity is to anybody and everybody, you can't understand it. Yeah. But because God says it is, we believe it. Yeah. And, yet, and we believe it because that's, and the Bible, the, the Bible describes the persons, but never said the persons of the Trinity, but never says the parts of God, right? We don't have parts of God because God is God. God is whole, right? We can't divide out parts. Um, Chris. Well, given the right, but I, when my girls were younger trying to explain uh, they understood, uh, you know, they hear H2O with water. Well, I said, it's water when it's liquid, it's water when it's ice cubes, it's water when it's mist, it doesn't change. It's still that H2O that you hear of. This is. Yeah, that, that is one of the similarities, one of the analogies that you can have, but it is also one that if you take too far, presents a false doctrine because the water is water and the same water changes into water, liquid, or gas, or vapor, right? Yeah. The one God does not change between Father, Son, and Spirit. Right? So it's different than water, but there is a similarity in part to that. So, so and so you, you have that with, you know, with the three leaf clover, right? Um, and St. Patrick, that was what he, he taught the Trinity using the three leaf clover. Three leaves, but one clover. Well, those are parts of the clover, right? So even that analogy doesn't, that comparison doesn't work because there's nothing in creation like the trinity except the uncreated trinity so and if you understand it as i said please let me know i'll, I'll let you explain it to me <laughs> so mark well, i remember doing a bible study with that with my gentleman and uh trying to get the trinity and explain and one of the guys uh put it this way he says when we think about it too hard, our brain only goes so far, and then we begin to waffle. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the other guys says, what do you mean by waffle? He says, well, 
we're trying to put in what we think with our brain what it is, and it really isn't. We have to go to that, and then we become wavering. Okay. Where it's like, don't come in. He said, that's when the devil tries to find his spot to get in. So, right. And so what we have with, with that, we just, like, uh, we said, someone said it, we said it a few times, you just believe it, accept it, you take what the Bible says. One God, three persons, and you use those, that terminology that uh, Christians have used for centuries in the Apostles' Creed, Nicene Creed, Athanasian Creed. And, and why are we talking about this trinity here? Because that's what Jesus is saying with the word I am. Right, and we have that power that can that can have something unfathomable, unfathomable, and have it exist and have it work for our salvation, and it is powerful enough to defeat even death. Any more comments on, on that? Uh, uh, the Trinity, or I am, or verse anything verses twenty five, twenty six. Ken, my study Bible has uh, John one four as relation to it. And him was life, and that life was the light of all. Yeah, so we have, right, John's gospel, remember, is very circular in its theme. It's not point by point, but you have this, uh, I am the resurrection and the life. Oh, yeah, John said that in the very fourth verse of this book, right? In him was life, and that life was the light. Uh, and, yeah, ah, very good. Thank you for sharing that. Could have had that in you. So if you've taken notes, you could have added quite a bit here that in addition to what I put down. Um, so that question, you know, and what, what you don't know because you weren't there, but a number of times when I'm reading this verse with an individual, I get to this and, you know, and, and I always want to stop and whoever lives and believes in me will never perish, period. And then I'm going to talk. You know what I realized in, in our ministry? Just go ahead and read the question. Let Jesus' question be a question to the individual I'm talking to. And if, if I pause after that and I say, do you believe this? No, oftentimes, yeah. Or they get their own confession that comes out and, and they don't even realize that, that they're quoting Mary's response, which we're going to have coming up here. Anybody want to read um, just verse 27 there? Uh, we play the part of Mary today. Okay, you don't have to play the part. Just, we have Celia, just go ahead and read it. Yes, Lord, she told him, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. Martha clearly states where her faith is placed, right? Yes, Lord, um, she says, and I believe you are the Christ. What's included in that term Christ? <laughs> Remember that it's a good opportunity to review what the name Christ means. Anyone want to tell me the Hebrew for Christ? Messiah. Messiah. And what does it mean in English? Not exactly Savior, but is the promised one. The promise, not the, he was the promised one, but but the title actually has a meaning associated with kingship. He was anointed. Anointed one. So Miss, Miss, Messiah is anointed, the one who is anointed. Christ is the Greek for that, the anointed one. And then because he, the anointed one in the Old Testament was promised and was promised to be the savior of the world, we then in our thinking hear the word Christ or Messiah and can also think of promised one, savior and all of those other things. But literally the title means the anointed one. Yeah, thank, it's a good opportunity to, re to review that. But then also not just the anointed one, the son of God. And notice here, uh, she could have said the son of man, but there's a little bit different focus. Jesus earlier had identified himself as the son of man, which was the promised title for God who took on human flesh. But here she is thinking of, I'm, I'm focusing on his Godship, his divinity. This is his I am, his power. Yeah, so the son of God. Uh, comments or questions on, on, on that title? Well, I'm, I'm kind of a little confused now. You're talking about the son of man. He's also the son of God, too. But he's half part man, right? 
because he was born of. Okay, we talked about Trinity, and now we're talking about Christology. Christology. Yes. Jesus is 50% man, 50% God. No. No. <laughs> I mean, fully I man, mean. fully God. Um, 100% man, 100% God. What else in cre all of creation is like that? Nothing. And, um, and so, yeah, so we, there's nothing. That, and again, it's not like two boards glued or nailed together or two sides of the same coin. No, fully man, fully God in order to be our savior, right? So that his death would be for the whole world. So why would they call the son of man? He's really not the son of man. The son of well, he is the son of man. Okay. Is it his, right? The da Daniel's uh, prophecy, if you get, uh, if you read through Daniel's Old Testament prophecy, um, especially in there, the Messiah is promised as coming. And the term that's used is the ancient of days, and right, that is in there too. And the term that's used that, that he refers to the Messiah as the son of man. Okay, so that became a title that if someone said, I am the son of man, not a son of man, then you're a son, a son of man. But you're not the son of man because that pointed to the title of the savior who was the Messiah who was also the son of God. So it's one of those, so son of man and son of God, both totally true, um, but we see we needed our savior to be both of them. Yeah, who was to come into the world. And seeing that, that God came into the world, that's when he is our, uh, that's when he, is also the son of man, right? God in the world, Emmanuel, God with us. We see all that. And so let me stop and uh, stop me if I'm confusing you, right? If anybody wants to explain the person of Christ, God and man in the same person, I will let you explain it to me because that's where my reason gets to a point where, okay, did God say it? Ken? Okay, I was just saying the son of Mary. You know. Okay. Is he the son of Mary? Okay. Don't, and, and we avoid saying the man, the, the man part of Jesus, right? Son of Mary, we could, we recognize who that is. Is Jesus? He's our Savior. The, what that does not indicate an Old Testament prophecy fulfilled, though. So while we can use that terminology correctly and say Jesus is the son of Mary, um, recognizing that. But the, and in that thought, we'll think of the virgin birth and all the, that faith-based and, and what our faith is built on. Um, and we'll see it related to him being the Messiah. The virgin birth is how God and man are in one person. Okay, so, but again, son of Mary was not an Old Testament prophecy. They didn't, they didn't say his mother, what his mother's name would be. That we had to wait until Luke. Uh, Celia, you had your hand up. I was, I was wondering how it could be son of man and also because then they said something about he was born of Mary, who was part of man. Yeah, the descendant of Abraham, descendant of Isaac, descendant of Jacob, descendant of King David, uh, descendant of Adam, descendant of uh, Noah, <laughs> right? Um, so. Uh, all right, and then, yeah, we can talk about this further as well, too. But yeah, that, that this confession, think of everything that, that Martha is confessing when she says, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. She was listening, and maybe in, in a lot of ways better than, than the disciples. And, 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 and maybe the crisis moment of her life, you know, that she had to treat, her brother's dead. And she's devastated at that loss. And yet, she's holding on to her faith in Jesus. And that, that's really, you know, those, those crisis moments crystallize our faith. Still think, right? Comment, more additional comments, questions on that? All right. We might not get to chapter 12, but let's at least try to get to this, this thing that's going to happen. Shocking. Um, what happens at the tomb. Um, so we had Martha talking with Jesus, 28, uh, 
comes up at someone care to read um, 28 through, let's go ahead and go to 35, verses 28 to 35. After she said this, Martha went back to call her sister Mary. She whispered, the teacher is here and is calling for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet gone into the village, but was still where Martha but was still where Martha met him. The Jews who were with Mary in the house consoling her saw that she got up quickly and left, so they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. He asked, where have you laid him? They told him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Thank you for uh, reading that section. Um, so yeah, Martha lets Mary know, and, and, and we don't we kind of wonder how all that happened. She, Martha had her conversation, sent word back, or went and told Mary in person. Um, uh, and, well, she did go back in person and whispered. And she told her, uh, I'll, stay, I'll stick with the visitors who were here at the house, and, and you, you, Jesus is here, right? Teacher is here, he wants you. Uh, Jesus, why do you think he, he had waited, right? Uh, it says in verse 30, he had not gone into the village. He wasn't in Bethany yet, but he was out on the roadside where Martha had had the earlier conversation with him. Think of all the hullabaloo that's going on, all the crowd that's there to comfort Mary and Martha. And Jesus, okay, before I get into the whole crowd, uh, private word with each of them. Right? So that's what he's, what he's thinking here. He, had, he was waiting. Um, and, and then, so verse 31 really does explain part of that, right? Um, because of all the people and yeah, they're worried. She's going to the tomb. She's going to go cry again and, and, um, and uh, at, at the tomb and, and needs, to, needs to see where the body was laid again. So they're going to follow thinking she's going there, but she went to Jesus. Um, looking at verse 32, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. What do you think of Mary's first words to Jesus? She's a copycat. No, not a copy yet. Well, yeah, Carol. I think those are just words from grief and suffering. I mean, she, she just lost her brother. And that's probably the first thing she wanted to say. Yeah, first, and remember verse 21, if you look on the page? Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Verse 32, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. I'm sorry, human nature. Yeah, the human nature is, is saying it right. And as I, we kind of had that review earlier, that's why I reviewed it. It sounds accusatory, but it's also a statement of faith, right? It's not necessarily saying you really should have been here and prevented this. No, it's like, it, it's a statement. You, if you had been here, I know he wouldn't have died. Um, Martha or Mary didn't, it didn't have the continuing statement that Martha had. At least it's not recorded, right? Um, uh, here in verse uh, verse uh, thirty-three, maybe she maybe she wanted to say the rest of it. Even now, I know you'll do anything, right? You can ask anything of the Lord, and it can happen. Maybe she uh, couldn't finish the next sentence. Maybe Martha and Mary had had some good private conversations between the two. Let's have Jesus come down here. Lazarus is sick. I'm sure he can heal him. And then after he died, yeah. If Jesus had come, I know he wouldn't have died. But when Jesus gets here, what are we going to say to him? We would. I think he can still do whatever he wants, right? I know he, he raised this young dead man from Nain in his funeral procession, right? So, you know, what, what was the death? You know, just speculate on those conversations that Mary and Martha had together without the rest of the crowds over those four days. Four days waiting for their pastor to come see them, right? If, if any of you, um, uh, please don't wait four days to call your pastor. 
if a loved one passes away or even extended family, yeah, let me know. And uh, I won't, for, won't, won't wait four days to come see you. All right. I usually will try to go the same day. If the, you know, if, if there's something going on that that uh, it doesn't work and you are too busy or all, other family is all there, the commotion is pastor coming is just one more thing to get taken care of. But no, I can wait. But uh, and and it's even when when my grandfather passed away back in 1998, uh, it was four in the morning, and my grandmother waited until nine in the morning until pastor's office hours. And I remember uh, the pastor telling my dad, well, you know, your mother could have called me at 4 a.m. And I'm going to tell her that, too. Right. It could have called me even then and I would have answered the phone. So. So, again, uh, Jesus was letting their discussion, Mary and Martha. And, we, and obviously that's all speculation of what all that happened. But it's very much indicating that the verbatim reply, they're not copying each other. They just discussed it beforehand. When Jesus gets here, what are we going to say? And they said what was on their heart. And, and then, uh, uh, and the the, uh, the Greek word here for weeping in verse 33, I didn't realize this until this time going through it. It's the word for an open, unabashed, public public display of, of uh, just letting it all out. All right. So that's that's what uh, what Mary and, and you know he he then. Uh, ask that question, where have you laid him, right? Next, next, you know, some of the facts. Sometimes that, that's the thing that, you know, when, when there's the, uh, the emotional part of it, um, could, have, could have taken that moment to preach a sermon about being the resurrection and the life like he did with Martha, but here, let, us, let, let her with her crying, and I'm just going to ask a fact. Where's he buried? And then they went to the tomb together. Um, and... Uh, and that's, yeah, come and see, and, and Jesus wept. But interesting, if you note in the, the, wrote it in the notes, the Greek word for Jesus weeping describes tears, but it wasn't the open and, and uh, just outpouring uh, of public, public crime. So he, 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 it's a little bit of a different, and it, I don't know if there's a, much we read into that, but it's worth noting. Um, Anybody, any thoughts on that? If with shortest verse in the Bible in the Greek, it's only two words, two words in the English too? I think the purpose of, of the time element was to strengthen their faith through this miracle. Raising somebody no, say, say that loud enough. Uh, the purpose I, of the time element was to strengthen their faith through the miracle. Yep. But the question I have is that you, you described weeping that maybe it was just uh, not so much the tears or the emotional, but uh, explanation of why of this sadness of, of the yeah. death of her. Yeah, now, right, and, and the, the, the expression of the sadness will, will be there, e even, if it's, even if it's controlled, right? Even if it's in the background, you, you don't have to, you don't have to, you have, don't have to avoid showing those tears when they are honest. And, and you know, so and it, like, I go back to this, this human thing, Christ, he's showing human emotions. Now, does that all go away when he, when he uh, uh, goes through the resurrection? Well, yeah, we, we have to stick with us until we get to the ascension, right? The ascension, which, is, yeah. which is in Acts, not John. But is Jesus still fully human in heaven? I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, he is. He's, is how did he ascend? Right. As God and man. How does he sit at God's right hand as God and man? How is he our brother in heaven by being true man as well as true God? And that's why we can sing what a friend we have in Jesus and know that it means he's still hearing our prayers. Right. So, yes, still in heaven, true God and true man, uh, still still fully that. Um, and and right. The book of Hebrews really makes a big point of still interceding for us. And, and that whole, whole thing of, well, the one who's interceding for us is the one who knows our pain, who went through even worse, who felt our emotions, who, who uh, gets rid of the middleman, right? We go to Jesus, who is the intermediary, but he's also God, too. So he li literally gets rid of the middleman, which is good when you're 
in, uh, in sales, right? Or when you're making a purchase straight from the farm, get rid of the middleman and the market. Yeah. Now, when we go to Jesus, we get rid of the middleman, or he's gotten rid of the middleman for us. Um, anything else uh, well, up I through? Saw, yeah, I saw about this true man. Once he ascends into heaven, he's still part of the Trinity. And I don't, you know, he knows, he knows man. It doesn't have to be, you know, true man. <laughs> I just I, I get a problem with that because he's true God. He is true God and true man. Oh, still now. And, and, and again, it's so easy for us to, to then use the word part of the Trinity again, right? Because we right. want to explain it with the parts, but he's not a part of the Trinity. He is a person in the, the Trinity, Trinity. Yes, right? The Trinity is one and doesn't have parts, right? right. So, and, and yeah, um, that, that's our savior, right? And 100% plus 100%, any of you ever taught first grade? Actually, percentages probably isn't until third grade, at least, maybe fifth. <laughs> uh, teach percentages, 100% plus 100% is 200%, which is two. Not when you're talking about Christology. Yeah, so yeah, we, we yeah. And, and you're asking good questions, and they're good questions to ask. I'm glad you're asking them, but then ultimately, I keep coming back to, yeah. It doesn't all mesh with our reason. Right. That is where is the limitations. Yeah. The we, human brain in verses in, in, in reference to this. There's something else in here that I remember from my Bible study that made a lot of people confused. Mary. Okay. Because you know, at least the Bible study I had, the guys kept going back, well, that's Mary. Jesus' mother. And I was like, no, this is a different Mary. Yeah, this is not right. This is not the Jesus mother. This is Mary, the, the sister of Lazarus, sister of Martha. Um, we are through verse 35 when Jesus wept. Uh, uh, verse 36. Does someone just want to read that paragraph? Verse and the Jews said, oh. see how he loved him. And then the paragraph 37 as well. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? So the crowd is there, uh, saw the emotion, and um, some of them are saying, could not the one who opened the eyes of the blind, blind man have kept this man from dying? Probably exactly what Mary and Martha had been thinking at the beginning, right? So he's, in my notes, I have that possibility of the question. Is he someone maybe with faith flickering, asking that question? Couldn't he have kept him alive if he had wanted to? If he was that emotionally attached to him? Or was it a, a scoffing of unbelief? He didn't come because he couldn't have helped him, right? So um, that's what we have there. And it, it's not explained, but it's a statement. And because some of them, some of the people there, we don't know. And maybe some were on each. Some of them was a statement of faith. Some of them was, was scoffing. Uh, Chris, you had your hand up. Um, everything that Jesus does has a, a teaching moment in it. They're just, like, when he was uh, his ministry, everything had a teaching moment, and he seemed to know where everyone was at, and always uh, something for someone to glean uh, from everything that he did. And when you look at even with the, the women back then, uh, the teachers, the rabbis didn't teach women. And here he was teaching women. He was always, always showing. And the children, he wanted to go home with small children by him. And every moment he just utilized. Yeah, utilized every moment and the teaching moments and included included everyone in that uh, yep and and that's why we can we can read it in different points and times in our life this passage this section of scripture we can see various things that are all teaching moments and it can let us ponder a, a new idea that that's always been there but it doesn't sink in until a certain time and that's why every time you read the bible that's where we're at that we see something else that Jesus had to share. Well, I don't want to leave you. We got about three minutes. I don't want to leave you hanging as to what happens. 
So let me read through uh, verse 44. I left you hanging last week, a cliffhanger. We're not going to do that today. So uh, verse 38, Jesus was deeply moved again as he came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Take away the stone, he said. Martha, the dead man's sister, told him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor because it has been four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I knew that you, are all, that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. After he said this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, and his feet and hands were bound with strips of linen, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus told him, loose him and let him go. So there's a lot there we'll cover. We'll actually have to pick it up in two weeks uh, after Easter, but we got a 90 seconds. I uh, might uh, go ahead and uh, talk about a little bit of this as we move forward. Um, you understand the, the way they had burials, uh, in, in that they use the natural caves or hollowed up deeper caves in, in that portion and, and use them as the burial places uh, covered with the stone so that people don't go in and so that the bodies aren't uh, eaten by wildlife, etc. cetera. Um, so we understand that. Uh, and as he says, take away the stone. What do you think about Martha's words, right? Um, by this time, it'll be an odor. It's been four days. Is she wavering in her faith? Just practical. She's being very practical, right? Uh, yep. Yeah, and you know, are you gonna go? Are you gonna go face that uh, smell and that body and and and, and all that? Um, yeah, very practical. Um, and then Jesus said, "Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God?" When did he say that? Oh, okay. Did, did, was that in my notes? Verse 4. You see, look at verse 4. The sickness, when Jesus heard this, he said, the sickness is not going to result in death, but it is for the glory of God, so that the Son of Man may be glorified through it. So probably this was uh, that Jesus is referring to verse 4, which was words that he spoke for the messenger, not just for the disciples, but take this message back to Mary and Martha. I'm not coming now. It's not going to result in, in, in death, but for the glory of God. And it did result in death, but not uh, just a temporary death for Lazarus. So four-day death uh, and then coming back, being brought back. Um, any thoughts on those words, uh, that comment I have on the right column? What word best describes how Jesus faced death here? Indignant, resolved, sympathetic, well, authoritative. Good. How about you? The conversation that was going on among all the different people at particular time in last week. So I would guess that it was probably a hush. Yeah, a hushed, awe, awe filled, uh, amazed. Yeah. Maybe a, a deep question here. We'll look, maybe start with that in two weeks if those of you who are here. Uh, just kind of looking at those uh, adjectives describing how Jesus faced death. And actually, uh, I can let the cat out of the bag. I really see all of them apply in some way or another. Right? Uh, but especially what stands out is his authority, uh, his power over, over death. All right. Uh, we are out of time for today, but let's close with the blessing. Uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you.